exists within, within the Facebook. So, so this is a pie chart of different program types. And if you're familiar with the current state of uh, um, BPF program types, you can see pretty much all of them there. Uh, what's interesting, another interesting point about this slide is that tracing stuff, uh, which is K-Pro-based programs and trace based programs, they dominate, uh, dominate the networking. Networking is obviously huge uh, just as well. Well, maybe because networking has this different C-Group-based stuff. But C-Group device is already used. It's not even networking, neither networking nor tracing. And, uh, well, all of them, realistically. Uh, as I mentioned, well, here this chart encompasses 180, close to 200 different different programs. And as I said, the different teams are deploying them and running them. And they come back to us, to the kernel team, with the questions. And we also roll the kernels. We have to investigate. So what it means is that, as a whole, the kernel team goes into lots of investigations. And uh, often, people starting to point out things that, well, I did something, and well, it looks like VVF. And did I pass it? The next week comes, and the next day, and well, it probably VVF again. So this is actually not true. But uh, as a VVF developer, it often feels that VVF is kind of responsible for all of the regressions and everything else that uh, that is happening. So let me give you a few examples. Uh, we have a packet capture daemon. Uh, that's rolled everywhere. It's uh, sampling one out of the million packets that uh, on every server, and it's doing just the standard perf event output uh, event through the perf uh, ring buffer back to user space. What we find out while deploying new kernel that somehow this daemon is causing 1% uh, CPU regression. You undo this daemon, this 1% regression go goes away. It's obviously using BPF, so it must be BPF. We went to investigate, turned out that this daemon not only using the networking, this uh, uh, SCAD CLS and attaching to the TC ingress uh, program type, it's also using K-probe for somewhat unrelated logic. And in a new kernel, this function simply disappeared. And because the daemon tried to attach to this K-probe, he said, well, the function is not there. It must be whole BPF is broken. So let me go back to the old style, the way it was written something like uh, six years ago. And with this old model, the way it was sampling the packet was based on the NFLock infrastructure. So to do the NFLock, it loaded all the APTable modules. APTable modules affect all the traffic, not only one out of the million. So we got this 1% CPU regression. So it, I guess it was, well, whether it was BPF or not, it's like uh, for, well, to, to be decided. But kernel uh, yeah. <laughs> Stable idea. Well, K probes. Um, uh, but uh, the p this, was, this was actually an easy one. Like, you compare one, you log into USSH to one box and see, well, there is a same daemon is running, but on one machine, do you have, don't have any VPF programs loaded? And you have this, well, IP tables modules loaded there. So it was, it was fast enough. It's like it only took an hour to figure out what's going on. Uh, the takeaway, the Kernel K props is not a stable ABI, and we of course keep changing the kernel. But what it means when people change it, well, somebody <laughs> in some team actually paid the price of investigating all of these issues. So, another example um, we have uh, so called, uh, so this is the daemon that's sort of like a perf. Uh, that we use for profiling and uh, performance analysis of anything. So it's pretty much number one way to collect uh, performance data from all the servers. It collects all the data, aggregates it into nice UI, the graphs, the previous version, A and B comparison, and so on and so forth. Um, it's doing like some fancy stuff inside the BPF program. Like this one actually was uh, open source. It's called uh, part of it is walking the Python stack traces from the VPF program. It's, we call it PyPerf, so it's kind of similar actually to Perf. And just it removes all the Python interpreter uh, stuff from there, it only leaves the interesting Python function. So all the folks who are developing in Python then see, they can see what's going on. They can see the performance difference between them, analyze, and so on. So uh, similar, 
we roll the new kernel, in this case 5.2, and we see that this daemon again somehow causing a 2% causing a CPU regression. And in this case, we knew that it's using quite a ton of BPF. It has the largest BPF programs we have. It's doing some, what used to do, well, this actual daemon was the number one use case for the bounded loops um, that, we, that we added because it has a ton of code. It was hitting this 4,000 instruction limit all the time. So it's, well, it must be BPF related. Well, it turned out that was the fix that uh, Peter, I think, rewrote and Thomas commented on his uh, song uh, from the Facebook kernel team they founded. Uh, it took quite a while to figure out what, what is going on. Turned out that just installing the K-probe, like any K-probe, even before you load any BPF stuff, the kernel was uh, remapping the pages from the 2 meg huge pages to 4K, so all of the kernel text became, became 4K which of course caused a bunch of ITLB misses and well caused this large performance regression. The takeaway, KPROP, whether we like it or not, is very much essential part of the kernel today. Like a lot of our tooling is dependent on the KPROP. Other companies are using KPROPs uh, with VPF introspection to, to see what the kernel is doing. And last example, uh, we have um, security daemon, uh, which is actually quite simple. It has only four uh, programs loaded, three for the K probes, uh, one for the return, return probes. It runs with a, a low priority. It's, if you look at the top, you cannot even see it, like it consumes 100% of the CPU, just tiny amount of memory. And in this case, it took several weeks for the database team to figure out that this particular daemon, this, just this one, so there was a bunch of other daemons loaded that they were also using VPF, but that particular one was causing the huge latency spikes for the, for the database. The, the throughput of the database was not affected, but the latency was. Uh, and in particular, the P99 latency was just like going through the roof and uh, like something is clearly wrong. Uh, well, it's using BPF, so when we got, uh, when the kernel team got involved, so this were the facts that the database folks uh, figured out. They observed that the just a regular mem copy in the database, in the user space, it can get stuck for, well, almost quarter of a second. Um, and we knew that this daemon that's using VPF, it's also a uh, region from the proc file system. There was a bunch of guesses, like why just a regular mem copy can get stalled for such a long time. Well, it must be doing the page faults and the kernel is probably trying to service the page faults, but it cannot because it's blocked on the uh, uh, mm semmer and top and something probably blocking this SEMA because it's reading PROC, and, but lots of other tools are also reading PROC, so why this particular daemon, which is consuming 100% of the CPU, may be causing this? So there were lots of questions, no good answers. We dived into the code. This is just how uh, PROC uh, in, in environment uh, is, uh, looks like in the kernel calls the uh, environment read function that's calling this access remote VM. And inside access remote, remote VM, there is the, the down read is happening, so the semaphore is getting locked. So before we uh, could say what exactly is happening, we need to first check whether these guesses that we made were correct. So for this, uh, we've used this funk latency. Uh, this is a BPF-based tool uh, uh, as part of the BCC tool chain. Uh, we have installed it on every, tor on every server, and most of the folks, they just know how to use it. So what we're doing here, we're saying for the next 100 seconds, I want a histogram of anything of the number of time of, of the, uh, the success remote VM function. And why access remote VM? Because we've looked at when, when uh, something, the user space is reading proc and veron, it goes into environment read, access remote VM, and that's where the semaphore will be taken. So, well, we indeed saw that uh, over the last 100 seconds, there were uh, three cases where it was all more than quarter a second, and 
So total of 10 cases where indeed something odd was happening. So now that we know that, well, indeed something does not look right. Um, we run another BPF-based tool that found that called func slower. What it's doing here, uh, I'm asking it to print me a kernel, this dash k, what it stands for, and user space tags for this access remote VM when the latency, uh, when the total runtime of this particular functions were more than 200 microseconds. What it shows, what, it, what, what the information gave to us that indeed, it was our security daemon that was blocked for this 200, uh, 200 uh, millisecond. Well, in this case, it was uh, 399. And it is indeed, this particular daemon is causing this latency spike. So the analysis team that the uh, database folks did indeed matches the observations that we have as a kernel team. Many hours later, I'm uh, playing with uh, different uh, tools. In this case, it could have been anything, but uh, I've been using this off-wake time uh, tool written by the Brenner Greg. We found this uh, curiously looking uh, stack trace from the kernel. So user space goes just read bytes from the proc, goes read the read system calls. It go, well, in this case, it was not in Veron, it was proc uh, command line. Uh, doing access remote VM, grabbing the semaphore, and goes to sleep. So I actually didn't know that the semaphore is not being released. So during this discovery, kernel is huge, millions of lines of code, even experienced kernel developers, well, there are dark corners in the kernel. In this case, it was a surprise to me that while reading pro command line, this user space task can go to sleep without releasing a map sema. Would it mean that any task who is reading proc pid command line and will go to sleep, that pid, that other process, will not be able to service any page faults until this other process will continue reading from croc only because the boss containing on the semap sema. This is, I'm not sure whether this is really known issue, but over the last years, kernel communities in general have been trying to break down the map sema into multiple. There were different proposals for the lots of them. So a map uh, is in general, well, in this case, the semaphore is a known issue. So the root cause was that why this particular game? Because it was configured to run with the lowest priority possible. It was the CPU quota plus the more aggressive, the scheduler uh, syscontrol knobs that were causing to, to um, this demon just well to go sleep, not just uh, to go to, to, to just 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 not enough, just very small CPU quota uh, was causing this latency spike. It would just go to sleep, and this database would be waiting, and this demon would be waiting because schedule doesn't doesn't let it run. It was very interesting investigations, one of the best. But these three examples, this was just from the few last last few months. So this is constantly happening. This is a lot of fun. And uh, take away from it to debug uh, BPF regression. It's very useful to use uh, uh, the BPF tools that uh, um, a bunch of folks have wrote in the BPF com community is contributing. There are are the kinds of BPF investigations we do in a data center. Um, to explain what is happening here, um, I have to explain how the development is done. Uh, you saw on the earlier slides that K-props and trace point general tracing is one of the dominating uses in data center. And for these cases to work, well, K-props is not a stable API. And for tracing, people need to look inside the kernel. So the way they're doing it, they're using tools like BCC, which is um, has an embedded LLVM and Clang. Um, and the program itself that depends on the kernel headers that installed on this given machine. Uh, you saw the breakdown of the different kernels that run, right? So there are like several major versions and a bunch of smaller ones. So the servers, they don't have one uniform version. And the kernel headers are different everywhere. So data structures are slightly different, but the program need to run on all of them. So the only way we could solve it back then, like two, three, four years ago, was to well, compile it on the fly. 
and this is uh, happening on the so on the developer server. Uh, people build the binary, integrate in this daemon, and then distribute it across the fleet. Then on a production machine, the clunk is invoked, it compiles the program uh, with the kernel headers on the given production server. Only then the object file is uh, generated and then it finally loaded. So security guys, of course, would be screaming if they see the compiler on the production server. The, what saves us here is that this compiler is embedded compiler, so you cannot just invoke it. So it's way safer than, let's say, installing GCC or Clang, just standalone on a server. But there are plenty of downsides. Just uh, taking extra space, because every daemon has its own embedded compiler, and there are a bunch of them running. Everyone consume. 20 meg of just plain text of a VM itself of RSS in the memory. You multiply by the number of demons that use it, that becomes quite a bit more. At peak time, when the compilation happens, all sorts of crazy issues are happening. Just compiling on the fly when you have your main database or whatever it is running will cause the extra disturbances to this uh, main application, which is not good. Um, Compiling itself may be too slow. When the database is consuming close to 100% of the memory, the s there is just not enough memory for Clang to compile anything. So we saw cases where 100 lines of C BPF code will take two minutes, two minutes to compile, 100 lines. All because the memory is all like consumed. It's all like goes into like faulting and swapping and so on and so forth. So. It took us a while to come up with this solution, but it looked like on paper it looked like this. What, we, what if we can compile once on, on a development server and then distribute this program everywhere and make only final adjustment of this program for the given kernel that is running there? So we come up with this compile once run everywhere slogan that compiles the program into assembler plus this extra stuff that uh, libpf on the production server will be uh, using to do this final adjustment, what we call the relocation of the final binary for the given server. This was the reason we uh, invented uh, BPF type format. That was about a year ago. Only now, it took us a while, only now we're finally at the stage where we can run, a, run it in production. Um, uh, how does it work? So we have program uh, that compiled with the, um, into this assembler NBTF. And on the other side, on production server, you have a kernel, and it has its own BTF. So what libpf does, when it loads the, before it loads the program, it compares the types between the two. And doing this fuzzy matching between the types, adjusts the data structures, and then loads the kernel. So what it gives, it gives, like it removes all of the problems that we've seen in the past. Now people can develop and test and do and test. That's mainly so. The operational experience from this is way better than than we had before. To give to illustrate to illustrate what I'm saying on the uh, simple example. So to trace uh, k risk be something like a drop monitor. Like uh, people want to know why a packet's being dropped. So they will put a trace point or the k prop. In this case, it's a k prop in the k free skb, and we'll be looking for things. So uh, in this case, reading the context uh, and let's say the if index, if index of the device that is uh, dropping the packet. So what's already challenging with this that the program needs to include both kernel and user space headers, and having Clang to include both it's already a mess. We struggled with it before. Uh, also, there are six function calls to VPF Pro read here. And uh, right now, well, it didn't look like a lot in the past, but now we see in the VPF Pro read as being one of the top 10 uh, most actively used functions. So, well, we need to optimize it. We care about last uh, nanosecond of the performance. Another part, if user somehow made a mistake, and in this case, kfrob is kb, if first parameter was not as kb, but it was like parameter two uh, to the, in the kprop, the whole function will work, quote, quote, but it will just take, read the garbage data out of the kernel, will be printing it happily. 
because it's like there is no type uh, checking. So what, how, how this is different with the uh, uh, compile once run everywhere? So the first thing th that disappears is uh, all the kernel headers are gone. With uh, BTF, we can ask uh, BPF tool, uh, this is the first line on top, to take, to extract all of the BTF information out of the kernel, whether it's running a live kernel or as a uh, VM Linux ELIF binary and generate single header file with all types, all types that are used inside the kernel, all of them. Uh, and really just, just read it. Um, and we introduced this new um, built-in to the, to the Clang because compilers, they care about optimizing the code and not as much about, they care, they, they need to make sure that optimization don't act correct, but they typically don't care about the types that being, that being done. For example, the Clang, it has uh, the internal uh, architecture of the LVM and Clang that the types are somewhat distinct from the uh, optimization types. There is LVM IR types and there are like real types. So to connect them to, we had to introduce this uh, C language uh, extension that will tell Clang that when uh, expression, in this case is just one expression like this uh, SKB reading the SKB dereference in SKB to access the device, it needs to preserve the types. It needs to preserve the indices of the real type versus what uh, LVM IR is doing. So it took, yeah, quite a bit. Well, it was difficult with the LVM upstreaming, but uh, now now it's landed. Um, there is uh, what, what it gives us uh, that this data structure is like taste trace k-free SKB. Let's say we make a type and, and swap the SKB in location. The, ver the verifier in store structure that uh, will be, well, the patches are not public yet, but uh, they will be very soon, uh, will catch that. So essentially we will have type checking infrastructure the inside, the, inside the kernel. So not only now it will be correct, like the references context SKB will be only like context SKB, you cannot make a typo. If you dereference the SKB device, with the old style like VPF Pro breeds, you can typecast it to whatever you like. And because it's a C language, it allows you to do so. In this case, the kernel verifier will catch your wrong typecast, incorrect accesses. It's kind of new, uh, well, I don't know, new error. I would say the C style development because like it's not quite C, I guess, anymore. Um, but before, before I talk more about the, the verifier, let's see uh, what we achieved so far. Uh, I look back when I was doing the slides uh, last week, I look back and it did look like we have achieved a lot. Uh, this year was uh, very eventful uh, in a BPF development. The bounded loops finally landed. It took us two years we've been talking about it. It was a huge uh, team effort. Uh, John Fastab and Edward Cree, they contributed a ton. Um, kudos to them. Now it's finally there. It seemed absolutely impossible. Uh, two years from now, now the stuff is working and well, it seems to be well correct. Uh, spin lock was they were also unthinkable, like how you can safely check that the program will not deadlock, that you actually like grabbing the, the, grab the lock, the only access in the locked uh, data structures under the lock and you're releasing it later. Now Verifier can do all of this stuff. I think this is like truly amazing what we able to achieve in 2019 and in 2020. Uh, I'm sure we'll have more. What's interesting here that most of the time when people talk about BPF verifier, they're saying, oh, this is like dreadful verifier. Oh, it's so pain to deal with. It's so dumb. Well, uh, I think it's actually smarter uh, than the, the regular LVM. Uh, why is it so? Compiler in the user space have a different goal when it's, uh, analyzing the code. The compiler job is to optimize the code safely. Whereas for the kernel BPF verifier, it's goal to prove that the generated code is actually safe. 
So the data flow analysis that both do, LVM does its own way, there is a huge infrastructure there. And the kernel side, the whole verifier is about like data flow analysis. They, they serve like different purpose. And what came out out of it, I was recently like debugging the dead code elimination optimization in the VPF verifier in the kernel and was surprised to see that it's removing the code. It's saying this code is dead. And I couldn't believe it. Like, well, before, so before last uh, end years I was doing kernel work, before that was doing seven years of the compiler development and before that kernel as well. So during my years being a compiler developer, I kind of started to believe in compiler so much that I couldn't believe that LLVM with Dash 2 will not be able to find that code. Turned out, well, it is the case. Compiler doesn't have to. Like, it optimizes the code to make it faster. It doesn't need to find all the cases where the code is dead. So the right case is just a small program. We have it. It's part of the self-test right now. Yeah, well, maybe future LLVM will do a better job, but there are cases where Verifier finds stuff even after LLVM did the best it could. Uh, when analyzing the code, before we came up with the BTF, the only thing the verifier had is this BPF assembler. Uh, it's looking at assembler instruction and doesn't know what this load from R1 plus 8 will do, unless it was told that this R1 register R1 is a pointer to, let's say, the context, and with this is valid access uh, facility that is uh, extensions to different program types, it will know that number 8 is actually will be like a SKB-LAN field. Then it will know, oh, I'm reading the length, and that's why it will be allowed. So everything today is hard-coded uh, as a proper C kernel code. With BTF, we'll be able to get to the next level. So why I'm calling this Verifier 2.0, if uh, last years of the de BPF development, we had only assembler to analyze, now we have in kernel BTF that we can trust. We could never trust anything for safety reasons that comes from user space. So, when we were for example, when we were developing the bounded loops, there were plenty of ideas. Well, can we teach a little VM to give us a hint where the loop starts, where the loop ends? It all sounds nice in practice, but kernel cannot trust any kind of annotations. There is only assembler it has to verify. Within kernel BTF, we have BTF that's part of the kernel. All of it is trusted by the well, because it's part of the build. Like, we, there are K old sims that are, see, that are inside the kernel. The F trace is doing a whole bunch of things, like, after the kernel. Like, VM Linux now is built in four or five steps. And there are many different things. Perl scripts was doing stuff to process this extra VM Linux to embed it again into VM, li into VM Linux. The build process itself is trusted. Like, everything that's being built. In kernel BTF, it's being built part of this build process is trusted as well. When the kernel boots up, it knows that this BTF is a um, description of what kernel is really, well, the state of the kernel. Uh, that's why the verifier can use that to do this more precise, uh, more precise uh, analysis. What it will allow us to do right now, uh, you, uh, you saw my pie chart of different BPF programs, uh, program types. Uh, there are a ton of them, and for every one of them, we have this is valid access callback. Uh, that's, I would say, number one cause of the code bloat in the BPF subsystem. Every developer that wants to add a new program type for BPF new use case in uh, storage, in security, the first thing they need to do, well, I need to define my is valid access. And sometimes it's copy paste of a few hundred lines. Most of the time you cannot really copy paste things. And uh, even more so on this conversion of context access. So this is an example from the Justice KB accessor. Let's say this length field, we have this underscore underscore SK buff mirror of the kernel data structure to make sure that we that the kernel itself can change SK buff the way they'll whenever and whichever way. And this user space mirror that is ABI that the programs are using. And we need to do this kernel adjustment by checking whether offset is five, and then we'll change it to this to whatever the current kernel is running. Since we have a VTF now. We will be able to remove this thousand lines. Well, it's actually 4,000 lines of code in just 
net core filter that C that will be able to remove, well, with a small star there, once BTFK config is on. So it, it won't happen tomorrow, but uh, we're hopeful. And this is just one of the use cases. So uh, it's, I think it's super exciting that the year of uh, BTF development got us to the stage where there is extra information that we can use. Just in one week um, of uh, having this prototype in the patches, uh, there were many new different ideas, like how we can use this extra knowledge, extra information that Kernel can use to do all sorts of crazy stuff. So where uh, you can help. Um, BPF is is a facility to extend the kernel. Hack your favorite extension, use it for your favorite feature, and if you like it, share it. Tell us like where we did well. If you hate it and doesn't fit at all, please also tell us. We we'll love we we'll love the feedback. Once you, and eventually, once you get comfortable with with infrastructure invent new stuff. Um, everything that you add, all the new features we consider from the whether there is a real use case for it. Uh, we always ask for any new patch that being sent to VPF and NetDev mailing list, we ask why? Why do you want this feature? Behind every program type and every map type there is a real use case. We want kernel to be relevant, we want you to extend it, tell us how you're doing it your extensions effectively, like shaping the future kernel. Thank you. <laughs> what questions do you have? No. Um, is there some news about uh, eBPF uh, formal verifier? Formal verification or formal proof or stuff like formal that? Formal verification. Uh, not sure what you're referring to. So there is a um, paper written by VMware Research and uh, other folks of new kind of verifier that using uh, a different approach to the verification. Is that the one you're talking about? Yes, yeah, so we've, uh, well, We've looked at the paper, like I've read a few times, uh, many folks said so this discussion is ongoing. There are plenty of interesting ideas there. Uh, one thing that sort of not allows us to use it as is, is time. Right now, the, what they, well, there are many different things, but one thing is uh, it's uh, 100 times slower, just to verify. So the simple stuff takes up to a minute to check. So well, if you're waiting for a minute to program to load, that's challenging. <laughs> Any more questions? OK, uh, thank you again. You can catch me always in the hallway if you have any questions. And enjoy the conference.